Thank you very much, Senator Sinodinus. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I rise to oppose the Migration Amendment Maintaining the Good Order of Immigration Detention Facilities Bill 2015. And I'd first like to start by dispelling some of the myths that we've heard, uh, as usual, from the Abbott government uh, in relation to uh, this bill. And the first myth that I would like to dispel is this um, blatant uh, misuse of the Hawke-Williams report. Uh, they cite it, the Abbott government cited it as somehow as the magic bullet, the, uh, the formulaic response, if you like, to why we're we going down this track. But of course, the, um, the Hawke-Williams report doesn't um, mention uh, anything in relation to the use of force, and yet we hear the Abbott government uh, use that report as somehow a justification for the, where this use of force come from. And I quote, when we look at the parliamentary, parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, when assessing this bill said, further, the committee notes that the Hawke-Williams report, which is cited in support of the stated objective of the measure, does not contain any reference to the inadequacy of the common law regarding the use of force and did not recommend creating a statutory use of force power for employees of an IDSP. Rather, it focused on ensuring appropriate arrangements to clarify the respective roles and responsibilities of managing security be between the department, the IDSP and the police, and recommended the establishment of a protocol. That's what the report says. So anything we hear uh, from the Abbott government saying that uh, somehow the um, Hawke-Williams report backed in the use of force is completely uh, incorrect. The second issue, which I'll just mention briefly and then mention further in my response, is this issue of uh, training. Now, in my former role as an official at United Voice, I organised detention centres, so I'm well aware uh, of what happens in them from the perspective of the guards. And again, we heard somehow that um, these guards, if they were given the powers to use force, would be appropriately trained. And we just heard the Certificate 2 mentioned. Well, the Certificate 2 is already the certification that is uh, sought by detention officers. They already have a Certificate 2 in security operations. And let me tell you a little bit about that certificate, because one of the other roles I had as an organiser at United Voice was I also organised security officers. Now, a certificate too in security operations, and I sat on national training boards and state training boards and signed off on these certificates. So I think I've got a fair amount of experience when it comes to knowing uh, what a certificate too in security operations is for. That certificate is for people who act as security officers who stand outside of banks or shopping centres or who drive around at night and patrol premises. It has nothing, nothing to do with detention facilities. And the only reasons it's, it's used is because it's in, in an inadequate response to the requirement to have trained officers. It was never, ever intended for detention centres. It is for the use of people who are licensed security officers under state police acts to guard premises, banks, shopping centres, supermarkets, or who undertake what are called mobile patrols, where they patrol buildings usually at night and they leave their card. And it is an entirely inadequate, inadequate uh, certificate for um, this type of work. Completely inadequate. So as I rise to oppose this bill. The bill seeks to formally establish a use of force regime in Australian detention centres. In opposing this bill, it is worth stepping back and identifying who will be given the authority and sanction to use force. Australian detention centres are run by private profit-making services. The current operator of Australian detention centres is Serco a large multinational com company with a controversial history in running private prisons in the UK and in my home state of Western Australia, 
Serco has been completely incompetent in running WA's brand new flagship hospital, Fiona Stanley. It was the Barnett government's decision to privatise this hospital. It's been nothing but chaos since this ill-considered decision was made. The last bungle involved the sterilisation of instruments used in surgery. Serco showed itself to be incapable of running this essential part of the hospital, so much so that the Barnett government was forced to take the sterilisation service back in-house, back into the hands of competently directly employed professionals. What I can say about detention centre contracts, again from my experience as an official at United Voice, is that these contracts are usually awarded to the cheapest contractor. Okay. And you won't hear the government say that, but in my long experience of organising in detention centres, when contracts change, they always went to the cheapest contractor. This means that the workforce is often low paid. And certainly, in the case of detention centre staff, their wages are significantly behind those of similar officers employed in the public service, which is essentially why this service is contracted out, because it comes down to dollars. Opportunities for training and building a career are limited, as many contract detention staff are employed part-time and casual. These are the officers who have just been described as professionals and, of course, taking nothing away from the individuals who do the job. <coughs> I agree with Senator Senadinas. They are often fine people, but they are employed part-time and, in substantial numbers, they are casual, so they don't have uh, any prospect of ongoing employment. And in any event, there is little or no scope for moving up the scale or career opportunity as there are effectively two levels of officers within the Serco detention centre, entry level and post-entry level, and then there are supervisory levels. A low-paid, casual workforce does not create a workplace where employees feel valued or where workers feel they have the support of their employers as they battle for shifts and decent pay. Just a few months back, Serco concluded an agreement with the union, United Voice, and no provision, no provision, none, has been made for this new position of authorised officer. Despite those office, opposite telling us that this was a professional position, that these would be highly trained uh, authorised officers in their wages and conditions, no allowance has been made for this new authorised position with the onerous responsibilities uh, that come with the use of force. Nothing. Despite the government's bill, which would give contract detention centre staff uh, the new authority to use force, a bar to legal proceedings and questionable additional training, which will be some secret deal between the minister and the private profit-making contractor Serco, there is no mention of this new classification. And some in this place might be surprised to learn detention centre officers earn a maximum, maximum base pay of $29 per hour. There is a requirement for formal training, but only to the level of Certificate II in security operations, which I have just described, is a certificate which applies to static guards, people who guard banks, or mobile officers who patrol around and guard buildings, usually at night. Again, this is entirely inappropriate, as this qualification is a general security qualification and is designed for security officers to manage shopping centres and banks, not people seeking asylum. The skills and knowledge, if you look at the uh, training and you look at the competencies under a Certificate II security officer, are completely at odds with the skills and knowledge of an authorised officer. This person, this authorised officer, who will be expected to deploy when faced with a decision on whether or not to use force. It is likely that an authorised officer will find him or herself in a conflict situation and will be required to make an instant decision, a heat-of-the-moment decision to use what the bill describes 
as reasonable force. When the training at this level, at Certificate 2 level, describes a competent person, so that's someone who's completed the, the course and met the competencies, as being able to demonstrate limited judgment, limited judgment in structured and stable contexts and within narrow parameters. That is not heat of the moment. That is not making that snap decision about um, whether or not to use force. The, uh, the Australian qualification level two criteria, which is the certificate two in security op operations, clearly sets out that a person at that level is not competent to undertake uh, that level of decision making. Yet the government doesn't blink. The government has paid no attention to the upskilling of detention centre officers, and despite the enterprise bargaining agreement just being concluded, Serco made no attempt to include the new authorised officer classification, increase the qualification level, or suggest a higher rate of pay for an officer who will, if this bill passes, be given the enormous responsibility beyond the level of their competency, their level two training, of using reasonable force. Now it's easy to figure out why Serco didn't want to include this new classification in its enterprise agreement, because it would eat into their profits. It's harder to figure out why the government is disregarding its duty of care towards detainees, asylum seekers, by presenting the Senate with a bill which on all of its key components is found wanting. During the Senate inquiry, when I asked the government department responsible for this legislation if they were aware of ongoing negotiations between Serco and the union, they took the question on notice. And their response was inadequate, to say the least, stating that it was a matter for the parties, not the government. From a government who wants to substantially change the duties of detention centre officers somehow didn't think they should be involved in it. What a cop-out when the government itself is asking this parliament to give contract detention centre officers more powers than the federal police, more powers than prison officers. They wash their hands of training requirements and applicable rates of pay. In fact, when questioned during the hearing, the department said in evidence that contract detention centre officers had similar training to West Australian police officers and Victorian, beg your pardon, to that of WA prison officers and Victorian police. Nothing could be further from the truth. Victorian police undertake a diploma of public safety, 33 weeks full time, with a further on the job training component of 83 weeks, which gives a total training period of two years and three months. Compare that for a moment with a certificate two in security operations, which you can get on a weekend. This is the training qualification the government say is adequate uh, to give detention centre staff the authorisation to use force. And of course, this qualification that the Victorian police undertake is a diploma qualification, not a certificate two, a diploma qualification, a stark contrast to a certificate two in security operations, which, as I said, can be done over two days. And the difference in the applicable knowledge and skills could not be more different. And in Victoria, the use of force is defined as reasonable and necessary, a test the Abbott government doesn't want to put into uh, this use of force in detention centres. And let's not forget this inadequate training will be a secret between the minister and the contract. So with the Victorian police, at the end of this diploma qualification, they have the skills and knowledge to apply uh, the knowledge and skills to demonstrate autonomy, judgment and defined responsibility in known or changing contexts. Compare that with the uh, outcome for a certificate to a security officer, which is in stable uh, conditions and under supervision. 
And obviously, government senators at the hearing were concerned about this secret deal, as in their majority report, they recommended that the training be a legislative instrument and not a secret deal between the minister and the private for profit contractor. And who is the government saying must be protected? Right now, there, there were at the time of the hearing around about 16, 1,635 people in Australian detention centres. And despite the broken promise and rhetoric of the government and its dirty deal in the Senate about releasing children uh, by last Christmas, there were at the time of the hearing around 115 children in detention in Australia. So that leaves, if you take the children out, about 1,520 adults in detention, of which we were told at the Senate inquiry into this bill there, were, there are about 8 per cent of that population, 8 per cent that, of that population that the government's concerned about, you know, the bikey gangs and all the other labels they like to add. So that means this bill really is being put in place to deal with around 120 people. A hundred and twenty people. They want to put into place a good order bill that gives detention centre officers the right to use force for about a hundred and twenty people. That is really what we are talking about here. A hundred and twenty people. In the explanatory memorandum, the minister sets out the reasons for this bill, which seem to go to the presence of high-risk detainees with behavioural challenges, such as members of outlaw motorcycle gangs, that jeopardise the safety, security and peace of our immigration detention centre facilities and the safety of all persons within that facilities. Of course I am concerned about the safety of people in detention centres, whether they are people uh, who are refugees or whether it is staff. But seriously, the way the government flies refugees around this country, I think it could gather up the 120 people and put them in one place and hold them securely. So I'd suggest you do that before you pass a bill that unilaterally gives detention centre officers who are low paid and poorly trained the authority to use force. Seriously, the government wants to introduce a bill which gives sweeping powers to contract detention centre staff to use force, of which the only test for the use of this force is that it's reasonable to use that against 120-odd individuals whom the government is actively seeking to deport. Seriously, this beggars belief. I believe this bill is more about demonising the bulk of those 635 individuals, men women and children who have a legitimate right a legitimate right to seek asylum in this country and the government is trying to interfere with that right by slowing down the application process and attempting to paint their usual picture of people as queue jumpers as illegals as illegal boat arrivals and whatever other labels they uh, attempt to put on in this place uh, that they are somehow people that law-abiding Australians ought to be frightened of, and nothing could be further from the truth. I heard in evidence at the inquiry that people who had been granted asylum were still waiting in detention centres, and that on average people waited for around 400 days once their paperwork was submitted. Of course, in reality, people wait much longer as getting to the submitting stage can take years. And of course frustrations will arise when people are held for indefinite periods with no end in sight. Ensuring that processing, done, processing is done in a timely fashion and keeping people informed about their application for asylum would go a long way to keeping frustration levels low. The committee received a number of submissions from law experts and the Human Rights Commission and all expressed the same grave concerns about the use of force, the bar on legal proceedings and the whole elements in this bill. And even, as I said, the government's own senators have raised concerns about the use of force and the need for clarification. But despite that, the government seems hell-bent on pushing this bill through the parliament. Well, Labor and others have significant 
amendments to this bill, and I would hope that they are accepted by the government. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator, for your contribution.